Hey, it's Larry. Uh, thanks for listening. Happy New Year. Real quick, before we get into this episode, I had such an amazing, eye-opening, life-changing experience at the World Parkinson Congress in Kyoto that I want others to have that opportunity, too. So Becca Miller and I and 24 of our PD community friends have launched a year-long WPC Travel Grant Fundraiser. We're each doing a two-week Facebook fundraiser. Mine's underway right now because my birthday's January 9th. All the money raised will be used to help offset travel costs so more people with young-onset Parkinson's can attend the next WPC in Barcelona in 2022. You can search out details on the When Life Gives You Parkinson's Facebook page or donate directly to the WPC website. Go to wpc2022.org slash yopdfund. If you or your business would like to supply matching funds... Hey, good on you. Email me at parkinsonspod at curiouscast.ca. And now, on with the show. Hi, I'm Larry Gifford. I have Parkinson's disease. Of the 132 pills per week that I take, 73 and a half are levodopa. This is when life gives you Parkinson's. Joining me on this podcast journey is reporter and contributor Nikki Reitmeyer. Hold on a second, Larry. Stop the music. Hold on a second here. Let me get this straight. More than half of the ungodly amount of pills that you take each week are levodopa. Yeah, yeah. Remember episode one when I described it as being a slave to a pill? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Man. You know, and technically, it's levodopa, carbidopa. They call it L-dopa. The big brand name is Cinemet. Okay. I've heard you mention Cinemet before. Remind me, though, what it is again. So Cinemet is the brand named levodopa, carbidopa, manufactured by Merck. Mm. It is the gold standard for treating Parkinson's. Essentially, uh, it's synthetic dopamine. So, you know, we've lost a lot of our dopamine-producing brain cells. Right. So this gives us the dopamine so we can move and, and live life. Uh, the treatment, though, is 40 years old. Right. This is ringing a bell because I interviewed Sandy Jones from Parkinson Canada in the first extra dosage of season one, and she remembered how life-changing levodopa was for helping people with PD. So by the time they had had Parkinson's for usually two or three years and were admitted to the hospital, they were so stiff and frozen, we couldn't even seat them on a toilet. They didn't bend. They were automatically diapered. We had to carry them anywhere they wanted to go. So when I tell you that I have actually been privileged to witness the miracle that is levodopa, I'm not kidding. That really is an incredible picture that she describes, and you can see why she calls it a miracle. Well, yeah, and she's talking about people two two years in being diapered up. That's me. I'm two years in. Like that, without levodopa, I'm pushed in a on a gurney in a corner and forgotten about it, and I'm dead three years later. Unreal. I can only imagine how important it is that everybody with Parkinson's gets their hands on this drug. Right, and right now, Nikki, there is a worldwide shortage of cinnamon. Oh. It's been mostly unavailable since the fall of 2018. And here in Canada, global news reporter Nadia Stewart reported on the shortage. What's causing the shortage is unclear. Cinemet is made for Merck by another manufacturer, though Merck packages and distributes the drug. In an email to Global News, Merck would only say it's experiencing supply constraints worldwide. And they've received an increase in orders far exceeding their forecast. So how long is this shortage supposed to last? Originally, Canadians were told it would only last until the beginning of this year, 2019. Now, in statements, Merck Canada says it'll probably be out of stock until July 2020. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, a Merck subsidiary in the UK called MSD says it's intermittent through September of this year, 2019. But regardless, Merck says most people are on generic levodopa, carbidopa anyway, so it's no big deal. However... For those like David Sangster in the UK, who's a vocal advocate and who was on sentiment and now can't get it, it's a big frickin' deal. So two days ago, I ordered my prescription from the pharmacist, as you do every month, and um, it's not the right drugs. Well, they're the right drugs, but they're not the right drugs because they are generic brands that aren't the real drugs. They're not the brand names, not the creme de la creme, the gold drug, the gold standard drug. So there's no cinema again, 
unobtainable, cinemet, unobtainable. So I'm gonna get these generic random ones in, which work, but they don't work as well. Oh, David's anger is palpable. Uh, he finds it difficult to understand how people with PD are being treated like this. This is a joke. There is no meds out there. There is no cinema out there, just generic brands. And I'm pissed. So, can someone do something about it, please? Because we need a meds. We have Parkinson's, we have life's lead. We need to move, we need to live, we need to go to work, and we need to look after our families. I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm an employee. Generic drugs, generic drugs are okay, the NHS is brilliant, but they will not do. Particularly when you, when you go one month on generic brands, and you have one month on, on the, other, on the other brand. One month on, one month off isn't good. We need consistency. The pharmaceutical companies who make these things or whatever, the, the distributors, whatever's going on there, where does the problem lie? I don't know. But somebody needs to sort it out. Man, you can really hear his frustration and understand it too. Well, yeah, and he's not the only one. Canadian John Hogan has PD and he's looking for answers too. What's the holdup? What's, uh, you know, is it, a, is it an ingredient? Uh, are they not able to get you know what the active ingredient is. And Gary Hasem has had Parkinson's for over 10 years, and he misses that cinemat. Well, I have a growing worry or concern uh, as to what may happen. The change in my symptoms after I took, uh, I began the cinemat were immediate um, and complete. You know, I gotta say, until now, I really didn't realize that there was such a drug supply problem for people with Parkinson's. Well, no one's talking about it. Nobody, I mean, Global News did a report, you know, last fall. I searched BBC, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, CNN. Uh, nobody's talking about it. And it's, I don't know if it's, we're not being vocal enough. So now I'm being vocal. It's problem. Yeah. We, need, we, we need this drug. Uh, taking pills three, four, eight, 12 times a day is not fun. And frankly, was one of the issues I had to come to terms with because what we have to do is take these pills in order to function. Uh, and it's, it's hard. Like I never took pills before. And then I got this diagnosis and now in order to do anything, I, I have to take these pills and I've got to take them on time. Kitty Fenton, who lives in New Zealand, also shares this struggle at being at the mercy of the pill. My eldest daughter, Amelia, was 11, 10 or 11. And she found me sitting, the, I remember sitting at the bench with the, with the medicine. That first time I got it and I was just sat looking at it and she said, what's wrong with you? And I went, I am going to have to take this. For the rest of my life, you know, I said, um, this is the first time I'm going to take it and I am never going to stop needing medicine. And she said, but it'll help you. I was like, yeah, but that's, that's just like a really, really weird thing to get your head around. The hardest thing for me is the knowledge that I may never walk down the street again without the aid of medication. Um, I find that really, really hard. Um, people say it's an easy walk, it's all nice and flat, and I think, oh, shit, mm. I can't do that. <laughs> That's strange. The thought of being reliant on medication for the rest of my life, does that make sense? Oh, completely. I, I, I never took medicine yeah. even when I needed it when I was... Before Parkinson's, and now I take 132 pills a week. Wow, that's more than me. <laughs> Actually, no, it's probably I'm probably not far off that. I take I take 14 a day. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. And, and then there's probably some vitamins and whatever else you take. And I'm swallowing handfuls of pills without water now. I'm I'm a pro. Like I could win the Olympics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Has the is, oh, has right. has the cinema shortage affected you at all? Yeah, we've got none of it here. We're all on kins and tablets. Um, David Sangster in the UK, he, he said it reckons it doesn't work as well, and a few people have said that here. I had one prescription of cinema, which was like a magic bullet and was amazing, and then uh, I got switched onto the generic kins and tablets. 
they seem to wear off pretty fast. Okay, so other than this insane shortage that I didn't even realize was an issue until now, when you actually do have pills that you're able to take, what about taking those pills is such a struggle? Is it a, a mental thing? Is it a physical thing? Well, it's it's both. It's knowing that you have to take this. It's being slave to this pill. Uh, and, and then there's the... Uh, I, I'm living my life, and I don't want to stop down to take it. So physically, I just don't reach my hand into the pocket when my alarm goes off and take it out and, and take them on time. I, for whatever reason, I, I don't know. I'm, but I'm not the only one. You know, uh, Rashida Ali, the daughter of Muhammad Ali, uh, chatted with me and shared some challenges that the People's Champ had with it. My dad would hide them under pillows and under the couch, and he would try his best to try to avoid taking them <laughs> because it's, it's, it's not really fun. So we would try to find unique ways to hide the medication um, if, if the pharmacist would allow us. Because, again, some pills can't be crushed, but right. some are dissolvable. And so for those that could be crushed and dissolved, you would dissolve them in his favorite ice cream, or he loved because he was lactose intolerant. He loved um, sherbet, and he would, you know, he it was tol it was tolerable. Now maybe I'll go get some sherbet from my pills. There now. you go. <laughs> it, there you go. It works. It works. It really works. Uh, it worked for him, and it worked for anyone because he hated that bitter, uh, you know, that grainy taste. You know, that's crazy. It's interesting that even one of the toughest men in history hated taking his pills. Yeah. I mean, who likes taking pills? It, it, it's sort of uh, it's a vulnerability. It's a weakness. And so it's hard to to do it every day. And it's just like, after a while, you just want to believe that, well, because it works so well, when it, when you're on it, you're like, well, maybe I don't have it. And so you, right. then you're like, oh, I just won't take my next one. And then you're like, oh, now I can't move. <laughs> you convince yourself that you don't need the pills. Well, yeah. But and despite our inclination to reject or avoid or hide the pills, we still want them and we still need them to function. Uh, and, and to really understand, to really get a grasp of why Cinemet, the brand name, is so brilliant. And to get some insight on what's really going on. I talked to David Ashford Jones. Now, now, this guy spent 25 years in pharmaceutical marketing and sales. So he's got the, the resume. Yeah. Uh, and he himself was diagnosed with Parkinson's at the age of 40. Wow. So he told me why this is such a magic pill. Cinemet is basically a product that was developed in the late 60s. And they finally worked out how to use it in the early 70s. It is a combination of uh, carbidopa, levodopa. So let me explain that. So the levodopa is a dopamine replacement. It's actually an amino acid, which is quite interesting because it'll come on to some of the things when we talk about absorption that you kind of need to be aware of. So it's got that. And then the carbidopa is a peripheral enzyme blocker. So it actually stops the levodopa being used in your periphery uh, and reduces the amount of dosage that you need and reduces systemic side effects. So how does it help people with Parkinson's? So fundamentally, the levodopa is a direct replacement for the dopamine that we don't produce. So to be honest, it's, it's the gold standard. Larry, I don't know how long you've had your Parkinson's, whether you've actually started on it, but if you respond to cinema, it is it's pretty much like being reborn. So yes, for sure, know, it's, one, it's, one, it's one of the great gift stroke um, ironies of the disease. You get given this drug that makes you feel absolutely brilliant. In fact, when I, when I first went on it, my best man came up and went, "Blimey, has, has your disease gone away? You're completely <laughs> normal." So I'm either absolutely perfect and moving, and you know you wouldn't have a clue that I've got it. Then when I'm off, uh, to be honest, mate, I'm, I'm almost kind of quadriplegic. I just literally can't move; just completely freeze. Why is there a cinnamon shortage? There, there is a shortage because one of the manufacturing plants fundamentally had a production issue. Now, what I think most people don't realise is when when you change your production in the pharmaceuticals, you have to kind of re-ratify your whole production cycle. So imagine if you, if you were baking a loaf of bread and you just swap the flour, you get a slightly different loaf, but it's not distinguishable. If you do the same thing with, with the pharmaceutical, so if they change one of the ingredients in the tablets, they have to go and re-ratify that 
and then you might get a sort of a slightly different loaf, although it looks the same. Does that make sense? It does. So are they re redesigning the drug or are they just using a different manufacturer? No, so it's just it's just a change of manufacture. So if if you if you kind of look, I think the, the Parkinson's UK site says that MSD itself is looking to change its um, production to Italy. And, and for what reason? Fundamentally, so they, they can get a, a better control on, on the, um, the supply chain. So Couldn't, they have, couldn't they have back. planned this out so there wasn't uh, sort of the, the, the hole in the market? Ah, well, that, 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 that's the, that's the $1,000 question, to be honest. Um, you, would, you would hope so, but then you can't necessarily always predict whether your, your manufacturing plant is going to get um, an issue or not. Yeah. So, so how big of a deal is this in your opinion? So Cinemet is actually quite an unusual product, Larry, in that it, it, we're, we're so sensitive to it. You know, we're, we're exquisitely sensitive to it. So most other products, it really doesn't matter if you get a slight variance in products. So if you get, you know, Nurofen or Ibuprofen and you get a generic version and then you get a branded version, the differences don't really make much difference with the pharmacology. Whereas with Cinemet, it makes a huge difference to us. And from a personal perspective, I can say that I started on a yellow oval Cinemet, got swapped to a round version of Cinemet that frankly didn't work. So I took it over at Christmas and we went out to a friend's for dinner and I couldn't cut my steak. And when everyone else went to the lounge, I just lay on the, the, the kitchen floor. <sighs> so it, we are exquisitely sensitive to the variations. So yeah. how big of a deal is it? Well, fundamentally, if you can't get your treatment, it's going to be a problem for all of us. And Larry, I'm actually looking at going and having a conversation with my pharmacist after this call because literally my wife went to collect my last uh, prescription and instead of about 30 or 40 strips of cinnamon, I got six. Six. That's crazy. That's nuts. Six of 30 or 40? Come on now. I take 12 pills of levodopa carbidopa every day. Cinnamon aside, I can't imagine not getting my full prescription. Showing up and going, you don't get a week's worth, you get two days' worth. Like, what do you do with that? Well, why is it, though, that the generic brand is so inferior? I've taken generic drugs before. You know, I think most people have. For example, acetaminophen and... It seems to work just fine. The important thing about medicine is its ability to be absorbed into your system. For a generic version of a brand name drug to be approved, it has to fall into a certain range of absorption rate Mm. of the brand name drug. Okay. It's called bioavailability. If you get it, if you, so if you take a branded version of Cinemet, the next time you get given a generic version, you could have 80% or 125% of the bioavailability of the brand that you just had. The fact is we don't know. David told me that bioavailability is even more acute for people with PD. Turns out it's a combination of factors that make cinnamon better. Because you've got the same bioavailability doesn't mean to say you've got the same tablet pressure in producing the tablets. So that maybe affects the dissolution rate. Mm-hmm. You may have different excipients in, which changes the rate of um, absorption and different things. And then on top of that, you know, we are, as a patient group, exquisitely sensitive to the dopamine. Man, this is ridiculous. Yeah, considering the number of people with Parkinson's is growing worldwide, you'd think there'd be some pre-planning. I mean, is Merck even aware that there's this shortage? I asked David, and he said, oh, yeah, they're aware. They are more, much more engaged this time than they were in 2013. Because, again, I'm sure, I don't know if you know, it's not the first time that the, the, this, the product's gone out. So it's, it's one of those situations where it's a tail-end product in their portfolio. They keep, keep a, an, an eye on it. But if you get caught out and you, 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 you basically your plant goes offline, then you're in trouble. Wait, hold on a second. Did he say that this has happened before? Oh, yeah. From 2009 to 2013, there was a shortage of cinnamon. Now, you'd think they would have learned. I have friends who are now on generic or have always been on generic, and now pharmacies are running out of that, too. Here's David again. So I think the trouble is, you can imagine that to ramp up your production is a bit of a challenge. So I think what you find is as the cinema has been going down, the genetic manufacturers have been struggling to fill the gap. So I suspect most people's capacity is absolutely at the top end. 
you know, what do you do? Is there a natural alternative? Well, it depends on who you ask. BBC writer, producer, comedian Paul Mayhew Archer uh, thinks he's found a secret to making the generic pills last longer, performing in front of a live audience. You know, normally my pills last about four hours, four mm. and a half. But if I'm, I'm doing the show, they'll last six and a half hours. Wow. Well, so it's, it's, well, it's like it's an extra just, dopamine rush. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, it is. <laughs> yes. So, um, I mean, they say laughter is the best medicine, and, you know, it's rubbish because, in my case, Cinemet is the best <laughs> medicine, but laughter is certainly pretty high up on the list. But you, since you brought it up, how has the uh, Cinemet shortage affected you? Um, there was a uh, um, moment towards the end of my tour when I couldn't get the Cinemet. And also, I couldn't get the generic alternative. Um, oh. And I happened to, t- I tweeted about this, and I said, you know, I'm glad that laughter is said to be the best medicine because I can't get the alternative. <laughs> alternative. And then, um, in the following week, at two of the shows I did, people sidled up to me and said, well, we've been moved on to a new prescription, so I've got some old cinema that <laughs> I... <laughs> So they gave me. <laughs> so I've got a couple of months extra. Nice. That's great. <laughs> hey, people helping people. That's what it's all about. That's right. I mean, it is wonderful when people, you know, if we, if we go um, on trips with a group of Parkinsons, you know, um, and somebody's forgotten their tablets, we have a whip round. <laughs> we can usually get enough together. <laughs> Larry, the Parkinson's community is awesome. We're always there with a pill. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And if you can't count on the kindness of strangers with Parkinson's, uh, the other possible natural alternative is fava beans. What? Fava beans naturally have high concentration of dopamine. So I asked David if we should start sucking on fava beans. (laughs) To be honest... You just you just barking at the moon with that to yeah. me. <laughs> so so this, is, this is where I perhaps I get a little bit controversial. When I did a review, you you basically the the amount of levodopa in in the the macuna purines varied between nine and about forty percent. Most of the samples it had degraded to virtually nothing. There's, right. there's no quality control. If you take it, you need to take four and a half to five times the amount because you've got no carbidopa with it. Right. So the, that basically means that you, you, you're you flooding your peripheral system with it and you've got no no um, no control whatsoever on the quality. And it just it, it's one of these things that drives me mad, Larry, where people say, well, it's natural. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's got levodopa in it. It's got dopamine in it. If it didn't have dopamine in it, it wouldn't be called bloody dopamine. You know, it's a dopamine molecule. Yeah, uh, 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 so that's a no on the fava beans. <laughs> yes. Again, Larry, you know, I, I express it as such. It's not for me. If someone wants to try it, you know, let, uh, there's something on my blog that says this is how you do it. You know, you should take much more of it because you have to allow for the carbidopa. You need to be aware that your, your consistency might not be there. I think one person in the UK did start it on a blog and then the blog went quiet when I don't think it was working for them. Well, what else can you do? Well, consistency is important. Mm-hmm. That's the key for taking levodopa carbidopa. Same time every day within like 15 minutes. And whatever kind of levodopa carbidopa you get, stick with the same brand and avoid eating protein around your pill popping time. Protein. Okay, why is protein important? Well, it's about absorption of medicine again. And David explains how it goes into your body. And let me try and keep this reasonably simple. The, the levodopa is a an amino acid. It's actively transported out of your stomach into your blood from your duodenum. It's then actively transported out from your blood to your brain. Those transporters also carry large neutral amino acids, which are amino acids that we have to have in our diet. So I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but something like phenylalanine. So if you take, eat something that's rich in phenylalanine, before you take your cinnamon, you will basically absorb less of your cinnamon because there will be a direct comp- competition with the uh, absorption. So okay. it's a bit like if you go to London. Have you been to London on the underground where you get a million students who oh, yeah. look like stood at the oh, bottom yeah. and you can't get onto the escalator? That's exactly what the situation is with the cinnamon. If you imagine, think of yourself as cinnamon trying to get through those students. If you get through, that's great. You get through at a much slower rate. You possibly don't get through. 
because there's, you know, a gazillion students blocking the, the escalator. I really like that visual. I think we can all imagine that in a busy train station and that elevator of people coming at us. Yeah, well, that really helped me too because I always like I was like, ah, what, what harm can it do for me to have, you know, pills next to my steak? You know, yeah. and, and having that visual, I'm like, oh, so while I don't necessarily notice that it's not working as well, it's not working as well. And so, right. if I want maximum impact, I, I have to to delay my protein for like an hour after I take my pill. And I just have to plan for that. That really makes sense to think of it on that biological level. Have you been able to get a hold of anyone at Merck to talk? Well, yeah, sort of. I mean, they flat out told me absolutely no to an interview twice. And I told them as a person with Parkinson's how disappointed I was that they wouldn't even speak to the people who, while angry now, are actual fans and evangelists for Cinemet. And another communications person called me right back late on a Friday night. Good afternoon, Mr. Gifford. This is Sarna just calling from Merck Canada. I hope you're well. Listen, I was going through my emails and I saw the note that you replied back to my colleague after she sent you uh, some information about Cinemet. Um, I, I, there has been a, a, some confusion on our end because uh, from what I know... So I, I talked to her, mm-hmm. and we agreed that I'd let them hear a rough draft of this podcast so they could prepare a response. And then I waited. And she did check back, asking for a deadline. And then a week before this podcast was released, I received an email with answers to the possible questions I might ask if we were to actually talk, and a note that they would not participate in the actual interview. Oh, that's so disappointing. Yeah. Ugh, okay. Bummer. Well, what did they say? All right. Now, keep in mind, because I'm in Canada, they kept their responses Canadian-focused. I'm going to recreate the interview with a guy named Mark instead of Merck. This is all we've got. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Merck? Mark. Yeah, whatever. Uh, why is there a shortage of Cinemet? Why, why couldn't that be anticipated? Cinemet, which is commercialized under the continuous release CR and the immediate released IR formulations, is made for Merck by an outside third-party manufacturer, but is packaged by Merck. The third-party manufacturer independent to Merck has been experiencing manufacturing-related challenges for both the CR and IR formulations. Due to these manufacturing challenges with our current third-party manufacturer, and considering that generic carbidopa levodopa alternatives are available, Merck will discontinue the supply of Cinemet CR in Canada once the current inventories have been exhausted. This difficult decision was made after unsuccessfully pursuing alternative supply options and is not related to any product quality or safety issue. It is important to note that there are no current shortages of either formulations of carbidopa levodopa in Canada as various generic manufacturers have made them available to Canadian patients. Currently, approximately 90% of the market of levodopa carbidopa in Canada is supplied by generic formulations. Based on current demand, depletion of the current inventory of Cinemet, CR 125 milligrams, is expected in September 2019. Cinemet CR 250 milligrams is no longer available. Despite the availability of generic alternatives in Canada, Merck understands that the situation may be disruptive for patients and is working to identify solutions to ensure a more stable source of supply is available for Cinemet IR formulation. Based on our current information, we are hopeful to be able to rely on a more stable source of supply for Cinemet, IR formulation. However, for the time being, the supply disruption for Cinemet, IR formulation will continue until mid-2020 in the Canadian market. Merck is committed to continue to provide regular updates on the situation to Health Canada and Parkinson's Canada. For the most up-to-date information regarding Cinemet supply availability, Canadian patients can consult drugshortagescanada.ca. When they say there's not a shortage, there is a shortage of generics because the generic companies weren't told that manufacturing was going offline for Cinemet, so they can't keep up with the supply. So, so, so people are showing up to get their drugs, and there's not enough drugs for them to have a whole month's worth. To so, me, that's a shortage. Yeah, so you're not buying anything that they said in that first statement. Well, I think they're covering themselves by bl- throwing their manufacturer under the bus. You know, it's it's a third party. It's not us. We just, you know, we they package it for us, but it's not, you know, uh, they're tap dancing around. So what is the difference between Cinemet and the generic? Did they talk about that at all? So that was the next question I asked. Uh-huh. What should patients with Parkinson's disease know about the differences between Cinemet and generic forms? As defined by health authorities, a generic drug is a copy of a brand name drug. 
The generic drug is pharmaceutically equivalent to the brand name drug. It contains the identical medicinal ingredients in the same amounts and in similar dosage form. Generic medications may have different non-medical ingredients than the brand name drug, but the company must show that these do not affect the safety, efficacy, or quality of the drug compared to the brand name drug. Currently, approximately 90% of the market of levodopa carbidopa in Canada is supplied by generic formulations. Okay, so so as we heard earlier in the podcast, uh, th- they only have to meet 85% of the absorption rate of the brand name drug. A- and and here's the thing, they're like, well, you know, but you know, 90% of the people uh, are are we're already on the generic, so it's no big deal. Well, so think about this. So they say it's a, a, a 10% of the people are on sentiment. I've heard estimates up to 20%. I've also heard there's 7 million people with Parkinson's, and I've heard there's 10 million people with Parkinson's. So what we're talking about here is somewhere between a million and a million seven people with Parkinson's. That's a lot of people that are having to find alternatives to their drugs. Yeah. So what do patients with Parkinson's disease need to know about maximum effectiveness or absorption? Patients should consult with their pharmacist or healthcare provider regarding their treatment options. All right, so that's a pass on that question. Uh, what exactly does levodopa carbidopa do for a patient with Parkinson's disease? It is believed that the symptoms of Parkinson's disease are caused by a lack of dopamine, a naturally occurring chemical produced by certain brain cells. Dopamine has the role of relaying messages in certain regions of the brain that control muscle movement. Difficulty in movement results when too little dopamine is produced. Levodopa acts to replenish dopamine in the brain, while carbidopa ensures that enough levodopa gets to the brain where it is needed. In many patients, this reduces the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. All right, well, that makes sense. They, they answered that all right. I like yeah. how they said it's believed to be caused by a lack of dopamine. Uh, why does it cause dyskinesia? Patients should consult with their pharmacist or healthcare provider regarding their disease. <laughs> they don't even know why. Huh. Isn't that funny? Uh, does Merck have another drug in the pipeline that may replace the, this one, which we've been using since the 1960s? For publicly available information about Merck's pipeline, you can consult our corporate website at merck.com slash pipeline. Feel dismissed to the website uh, Copy and paste here, it feels like. Uh, what is the timeline for Cinemet IR to be available in Canada, US, UK, and around the world? We expect that the supply disruption for Cinemet IR will continue until mid-2020 in the Canadian market. Merck Canada Incorporated remains committed to finding solutions to provide this product to Canadian patients as quickly as possible. The most up-to-date information regarding Cinemet supply availability is regularly updated on drugshortagescanada.ca. It is important to note that currently approximately 90% of the market... Yeah, 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 you've already said that. Is there anything the Parkinson's community can do to help? Patients with any concerns should consult with their pharmacist or health care provider. You can see, Nikki, uh, they're all heart. Yeah. Did we expect anything less from a drug company? Well, I thought maybe they would uh, understand that the people that are upset about this are actual fans and evangelists for their product and that they could speak to them directly and at least show a little bit of empathy. A little bit of compassion, a little bit of understanding. I mean, Cinemet is a magic bullet for some people with Parkinson's. I mean, I think the the key for all of us going forward is really the goal of this podcast, for people with Parkinson's to be more vocal. Imagine what it would be like if suddenly HIV medicine wasn't available to patients worldwide. Or how about chemotherapy? I mean, it probably wouldn't happen in the first place. It just feels like this shortage of medication is affecting us for a number of reasons. One, people don't know about this degenerative brain disorder. Also, we're like, hey, we're close to a cure. Hey, I'm happy and I'm laughing and I'm running a marathon. And like, there's, we don't put the urgency behind this. And so it's on us to make sure people understand this is a big deal. Uh, and that means we need to be more vocal. And like you said, that's the goal of the podcast. I did ask a few more questions of our friends at Merck. Uh, So um, do you have anything to say to the people that are fans of your product that are upset now that it's not available? Uh, (laughs) Did you listen to – did you actually listen to the podcast I sent? Well, (laughs) uh, do you have any reaction to it? Uh... Was it accurate? Yes, <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Every episode of this podcast, Larry sits down with his wife, Rebecca. 
So this is a strange little pill that I take all the time. Uh, what do you notice if I am late for a dosage or miss a dosage? The first thing I notice is that you get a little foggy. Everything slows down a bit. And it's harder for you to get motivated to move and do things. I notice that sometimes you'll um, be just kind of sitting. You may be doing something, but you're doing something small, like reading or responding to an email, playing a game. And it's easier for you to be kind of oblivious to what's going on around you. And that's that's different from how you were even a couple of years ago. The way it appears to me as an outsider is that the bubble becomes very quiet. It's frustrating because it's not something that I'm attending to put up a bubble. It does, everything slows down for me and it's harder to do things and it's more, mm -hmm. more effort. So you do, you get this singular focus and everything else just kind of like fades away. The physical symptom that I notice the most is you're walking for sure. That's your most predominant physical symptom and always has been. So if you don't have your walking poles and you've missed medication, forget about it. Like you're shuffling yeah. and it's every and everything slows down, um, which must be very frustrating for you. It is. Um, but that's also how I know if I'm near um, uh, taking medicine or if I'm late for taking medicine, like by even 15 minutes, right. I start to shuffle and I be, it's like suddenly I'll bump into a doorway and I'm like, oh, I'm 20 minutes late or something. Yeah. Like, and that's why they talk about taking that medicine on time because the, the longer you've been diagnosed, uh, the more consistency you need to, to can keep the ebbs and flows as, as, as small as possible. Right. The thing that makes me nervous about that is your balance because if you fall or fall down some stairs or fall while you're crossing the street or something like that, that can be dangerous and because your walking is your most predominant mm -hmm. physical symptom that is the the greatest risk for you and so that's the only time I think I get nervous about you and the medication is that you are out in the world you're still very active and if you're not if your balance isn't a hundred percent that's dangerous for you in listening to this episode what stood out to you more than anything frustration bit of anger with the pharmaceutical companies, with just the idea that there is an entire community, a very quickly growing community that is very dependent on one drug and its generics. And then all of this, this issue with the shortage has brought up and pointed a spotlight on the fact that the generics are inferior to the brand name. Well, that's the thing that I guess I realized in making this episode was that I was on Cinemet and then I was off of it pretty quick with the generics and then they kept increasing my dosages and I, I thought my disease was progressing faster. Mm -hmm. Would it, in fact, it was probably maybe a little bit of that, but also the drugs weren't as effective. And it's the level of medication that you take and a higher level of medication that you take for a longer period of time that causes the dyskinesia. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. I mean, so, the, so who knows how much dyskinesia people would actually be having if they were able to take less of a more effective drug. Oh, wouldn't that be great? I'm curious to know from the pharmaceutical companies what their answers are to these things and have they considered it seriously enough or are they only looking at the dollars? Right. And, you know, and the dollars uh, for Parkinson's medication seems significant. It, in the next four years, it'll be a $5.2 billion industry. But MS, which has fewer people affected, is a $28 billion industry. And uh, diabetes is a $78 billion industry. So why would they spend a lot of time worrying about Parkinson's when they're making a lot more money off a lot fewer people? Next time on When Life Gives You Parkinson's. What are your top hacks? What are things that people need to know? Get a good bed. We made a huge decision to invest in a bed that would have the minimal motion transfer. Mm. And it was just a way to respect the fact that something was changing. We didn't know what it was at the time, but we needed to deal with it. I don't sleep very well at all. It's starting to disrupt my sleep a little bit, but more than that, I'm disrupting your sleep because you sleep super, super late. Right. And I'm talking I'm, more in my sleep and I'm moving around more. And 
So this is, and we're, we're thinking more about our bed space and our private space and how we're kind of protecting our relationship and, and our sense of privacy and intimacy. Okay. Hello. Who needs a bed? Oh, well, we were looking at a bed. Yeah. Yeah. Do you like a coil one? Do you like a foam? Well, so we're, we're going to get uh, uh, single beds yeah, yeah, next to each other. No, for me, for us. For you? Okay. I've got Parkinson's, and so, oh, okay. so I move around a lot. I and, yeah, yeah, I so. Larry and I have noticed that um, our f- relationship in general has become less physical. Well, this is new for you, Parkinson's disease, and, and it's different for every patient. And, you know, you have a, a need to be close. You have sexual desire. Your body is changing. It is most of the time uncomfortable in some way for you to be in your body. So I am just kind of backing off. Well, see, and, and all along, I was thinking I'm becoming less attractive and less desirable because I'm sick. The definition of a sexless marriage, generally speaking, is sex less than 10 times a year. So you were in a sexless marriage. You might theoretically still be in one, having only had it once recently. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I take a page out of Nike's book. Just do it. This is When Life Gives You Parkinson's, a Curious Cast podcast. Our presenting sponsor is Parkinson Canada, parkinson.ca. This year, we're proud to recognize content and promotional partners from other countries, too. In the UK, we're proud to have Spotlight YOPD on our team, the only organization in the world with the singular focus of raising awareness of young-onset Parkinson's disease. You can find them at spotlightyopd.org. And in the United States, Parkinson's IQ Plus U. This is a free series of Parkinson's events from the Michael J. Fox Foundation that will be occurring in cities across the United States in 2019 in 2020, which I am hosting. And the podcast will be highlighting the events through the extra dosage episodes. So go to michaeljfox.org slash PDIQ to register. And thank you for listening. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, give the show a rating and feel free to comment. You can also engage with us on social media. It's at Parkinson's Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or email Parkinson's Pod at CuriousCast.ca. We would also like you to add your voice to the podcast. To record your message, go to speakpipe.com slash when life gives you Parkinson's. Keep positive. Keep exercising. Keep listening. We'll talk to you next time. Canada may be known for its landscapes and friendly people, but beneath the surface lies a darker side of crime, history, and the paranormal. Since 2017, the award-winning Dark Poutine podcast has explored the shadowy corners of the Great White North and beyond, delivering chilling tales from a uniquely Canadian perspective. Hosted by Mike Brown and Matthew Stockton with over 300 episodes and fresh releases every Monday, Dark Poutine is your weekly ticket to the creepier side of Canada. Listen to Dark Poutine on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts.